Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and uh, hopefully you'll have in a fabulous day. Uh, today we have a unique, um, basically video edition, if you wish, where we are going to add to a series that we have done recently concerning the corrections that were made to the Quranic manuscripts, specifically early Quranic manuscripts. Our series was based really on a book by. Uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Allen Brubaker. It's right here. It's called the uh, basically corrections in early Quran manuscripts. 20 examples, even though it has more than 20 examples. We encourage you really to buy this book and uh, to benefit from the wealth of information that is found in it. And by the way, we're talking like about 22, maybe, maybe there's one slide that has like nine images, maybe 29 basically uh, kind of examples. Uh, this is just the beginning of a series of these books that Dr. Brubaker is working on. It's based on his own uh, PhD dissertation. So you can see why this work uh, has been extremely important uh, for the academic field when it comes to the study of the early Quranic manuscripts. I'm one of those students that will benefit from it because I'm doing my research on one of the earliest Quranic manuscripts. But also, it's groundbreaking in terms of the fact that a Muslim who was raised to believe that the Quran has no errors, no corrections, no changes made to it, and it's perfectly preserved. Even the copy that we have here on earth is identical to the copy that is preserved in heaven. A book like this, or findings in a book like this, are going to be extremely damaging to that ideology. And that's really where we're going with this particular video edition. When my brother Jay Smith, who is sitting right next to me here in studio, hi Jay, mm -hmm. presented <laughs> this material at the uh, Speaker's Corner in London, he basically encountered some pushback as expected, but something interesting evolved out of that. And with that says, I'm gonna turn uh, basically the attention over to Jay so he can take this further. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, it's it's terrific to be here once again uh, to talk about things that we love to talk about and to talk about this book, the Quran. Uh, now, when you ever have two books that claim to be historical, the claim that has to be given of and the, the proof that has to be given of both books is that they must have a critical edition, a critical analysis of their beginnings. Now, let's put up the slide. I want to put up a quote from Dr. Francois de Roche. Let's put up the slide here, and this is what he says. Critical edition of the Quran. When the Al-Azhar specialists convened to produce a reliable edition of the Quran towards 1920, it was about 1924 to be exact, they never thought of looking for the earliest written witnesses. Had they known how to identify them, but used in the course of their work the specialized literature on the Qira'at, which is the of the Kirat, the dottings, the time when right. the dottings were starting to be introduced, or the orthography which developed in the Muslim scholarly circles from the second to eighth century, or second century age, or eighth century as we know it. That's hugely significant. Now, let's unpack what Dorosh is saying here, so for the people who don't understand what's going on. All right, the Kiraat, what literature is he referring to uh, that, that uh, Francois Dorosh is referring to? Uh, he's uh, probably referring to Ibn Mujahid's work. And Ibn Mujahid basically canonized seven specific qira'at. Okay, I would say in before Ibn Mujahid, it's in the 8th century when you have all these students from five different cities That's who right. are coming up with their own But it was canonized by Ibn Mujahid, but you're right, there is more than the seven that Ibn Mujahid even chose. We're not so sure what was the science behind why he chose only these seven and ignored the others. It's obviously that that was only what he wanted. That's right. Uh, now, uh, by the time we get even a, about a century later, there's another 14 that are added That's and another right. 10 are added. Keith Small went through this many years ago. I remember he talked about the 7, the 10, the 14, it, it, these more and more editions. By the time we get to the 20th century, 1920 to be expect, uh, 1924 to be exact, there are as many as 30 different Kira'at editions that we are, we're aware of that we've been able to find. And uh, this is fascinating because we've, in London alone, Hatun Tosh, who we had on earlier today uh, in the new live stream, she has collected individually herself, just herself, she has collected 34 of these. That you can that you can, are published today. You can get these in three different cities uh, in the Middle East. 
uh, she's going to keep looking out for others because it'll get up to close to probably uh, close to 40. But anyhow, this is what he is referring to. Because there was such a problem with so many different uh, variations of the Quran, with so many different kirat, so many different readings, uh, which are nothing more than the dots and the vowelizations, uh, they could not really have any standardized tests in Cairo. And that's why then, right. they, as we've said many times before, they had to ask Muhammad ibn uh, al Husseini al Haddad, this man in Al Hazar, to choose one. And he chose the Hafs. That's the one we have in our hand today. But that was chosen in Cairo in 1924. It was chosen for all of Egypt in 1936. It was chosen for the whole world then in 1985, 34 years ago. Now, right. that's chosen. They're only choosing really a Kirat uh, of one school of Kirat from amongst many schools of Kirat. They're just choosing the way you read it. The way you read it, uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you read it this way and no other way. This is not looking to the earliest manuscript. This is not going back. And this is one reason why François Doros is saying that is not a critical edition of the Quran. That is not what we're talking about. When we're talking about the critical edition, let's look at the next slide. Look at this slide here. When we look at the biblical manuscripts, how did we come to a critical edition, uh, edition of the New Testament? Well, basically, we do textual criticism. E explain that. What do you mean there? Well, textual criticism basically is going to look at uh, manuscript evidence, and they're going to try to find even complete manuscripts if possible, and they're going to date also these manuscripts, and they're going to try to look for the earliest possible manuscripts close to the time when such revelations were revealed. And in doing so, they come across, of course, obviously, uh, thousands upon thousands of these fragments or manuscripts. And they, when they discover, for instance, there are some variants, if you wish, or copyist errors or whatever you want to call them, they begin to do studies to try to figure out what the original would have been by tracing it back to these families of manuscripts and finding you know, if this error made its way throughout this particular family or not, if uh, this copy, uh, copyist was the same person uh, who copied this or not, is this copy that we find a century or two later was based on this particular family. I mean, this is what the science of uh, uh, basically textual criticism in a simplified way represents. Okay, so it looks at manuscript evidence. It tries to date them as accurately as we can. It tries to find out if there are different schools that have different ways of saying one thing. It looks for variants. It looks for anything that would help the researcher go back to the earliest text. And it gives them ratings. You know, uh, there is um, high ratings, you know, low rating. Ra the higher the rating, that means that this is probably what the original would have said. Now, up until the 1800s, uh, most everybody thought that the Latin Vulgate was the oldest text. This was the oldest Bible. Uh, and King James Version, I still hear people saying today, King James, if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Without thinking through, King James is an English translation in from 1611. That's right. the 17th century. You cannot say that that's the earliest text, text but also it's an English translation, nothing more. Right. Right. But what was more important is that you need to go back, and it was why people like Tischendorf, when he was there uh, uh, traveling through the Sinai Peninsula, he came at St. Catherine's Monastery, and he found that Codex, let's open, uh, put that slide up again, that codex that's in the middle, Codex Sinaiticus, one of the most, probably the most famous of all codices, because that's a Greek codex. It's written in the Uncial text. Uh, the Uncial text is a much earlier text than the school, which then replaced it, because if you take a look at it carefully, and you can see the Codex Vaticanus on the left of it, and the Codex Alexandrius on the right of it, these are, uh, these are known as the three metropolitan codices. The, the Sinaiticus is probably the most famous because it was the first one to be discovered. Uh, and the the reason why it's so exciting is it's written on parchment. It's not written on right. uh, papyrus. Papyrus you would not would not have survived this many years. Papyrus survives for about a hundred years. It's made out of leaves, papyrus leaves, and they just start to disintegrate. So when he came across this one, what was in a waste paper basket? And you imagine that in a waste paper basket up there in the, the Saint Catherine's Monastery. They, the monks didn't even know the importance of it. They were going to burn it to keep warm. They needed to keep warm in a cold night, a cold day, so that's why they had it in a waste paper basket. Tischendorf, who had done some studies, was aware of the Uncil uh, movement over to Minskul in about the fourth century. He realized that this is a very archaic text, very well preserved, and he asked if he could have it. And they said, well, we're going to burn it anyways. Yeah, you can have it. He took it back to Britain. They sent it up to St. Petersburg. They were the first one to date it to 325, between 325 and 350, so the fourth 
fourth century. Now, since then, there has been much, many more uh, date, uh, datings done on it, much more accurate datings, and we now know it is a fourth century. That is the earliest, along with the Vaticanus to the left of it, which is in Rome. The Sinaiticus is no longer in St. Petersburg. It has now been bought by the British Library. It's now in the British Library. I've seen it many times. Uh, it is so famous, however, it's, you, for those of you who want to go to the British Library to find it, you may not find it there because it goes on in exposition all over the world. The British Library makes an awful lot of money off of it. Nonetheless, that is a fourth century. The Vaticanus on the left would also be fourth century. The Alexandrinus on the right would be fifth century. So here you have three metropolitan codices, two to three hundred years older than the Quran almost complete. Now that's the Vakotikus, the Seniaticus, not only has the New Testament, also has the Old Testament. And that's before the rise of Islam, by the way. Yes, that's three to 200 years before the rise of Islam. So it's amazing that we can come up with this wealth of huge manuscripts. See, the, what I love about the Christians, they preserve their manuscripts. They uh, really, though they didn't deify them in any way, they loved the Bible, and that's why they preserved, and that's why we have such good preservation, like you can see on the slide right there. That's what we're looking for. We're asking Muslims to do the same thing that Christians have done with the manuscript evidence. Nobody sits there and doubts the dates that are given to it because there's been so much forensic testing done on it. We do look for variants. We're very open about it. If you open up my Bible, uh, I have my Bible here, and if you open it up to Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 9, it'll say it'll be very clear uh, that the verses that come between six, verse 9 to 20, uh, there's a line there warning the readers that they're not found in the earliest Greek manuscripts. They're not found in these manuscripts. If you open to John chapter 7, verse 53, to John 8, verse 11, uh, there's a line before and after and warns the reader that these verses are not found in these manuscripts, these metropolitan codices, these three manuscripts that are so well, so well preserved. If you open up at, to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, uh, you will see in my Bible, in the NIV, they've taken out uh, verse 7, and you have, or oh, it goes from 6 to 8 immediately, and that's the what we know is the Trinitarian formula. For these three are found in heaven, the, fa the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not there in any of these Greek manuscripts. But they put a footnote for you. Yes, so what are they in the footnote? It's not like they take it out and uh, all of a sudden it's hidden from you and nobody knows. No, no, they're telling you the rationale behind their decision. And what is the rationale? Do you know what it is? Well, in the footnote, what it is is to say the reason it's not there is because this was introduced in the King James Codex, the King James Version in 1611 by a number of scribes who actually, it was done, it was actually interjected in the, a century earlier in England. This was done only in England that this verse, a Trinitarian formula, was then introduced at this time. Muslims say, ah, that proves you the Trinity should be there. No, you can go uh, to Matthew, end of Matthew, uh, uh, chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, and see the Trinitarian formula right there. But that was important that, that a textual criticist seeing that, knowing that, then puts it in a footnote at the bottom said this should not really be there. We do that. We're very open about that. And they, they look at the earliest manuscripts. That's how they base these kind of decisions. Yeah. You always, always, always go to the earliest manuscript to came this kind of decision. Now, so that's seeing that on board. What I'd like to do, uh, it will bring this to a conclusion because now we know what textual criticism. What I'd like to do is see what happened on May 26 and what is now happening even as we speak with Muslims where we have asked the same question. Where have you done that with the Quran? We need to stop it here. We need to uh, go here, but we need to do, have put that introduction to see what we're going to see next. Very good. Well, in this case, uh, you know, we hope uh, that you will join us again next week. As you can see, of course, uh, this is very interesting, and this is building upon the work that has already been published by Dr. Brubaker and the work that myself and Dr. Uh, J. Smith have done through our video series related to this book and also the work that he's been doing with Hatun uh, for a while concerning the, uh, you know, the, the different uh, basically versions of Qurans, if you wish, and the focus right now that we're doing here on the early Quranic manuscripts. Until we meet next week, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sira International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this 
so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.